Mr. Speaker, some members want to know MOM's plans to deal with the housing standards of our migrant workers. A bit of historical background is useful here. During the 1970s to early 1990s, most migrant workers in the construction industry came from Thailand and Malaysia. Most of them rented HDB flats or private residential properties. In the early 1990s, many more construction workers came from China, Bangladesh, Myanmar and India. To support their housing needs, the government allocated land for companies to build self-contained dormitories with recreational amenities for their workers. BCA, HDB and JTC tendered out these sites. One important consideration was, what would a migrant worker want at the end of a workday if he cannot be with his family? Well, it is to be with his friends, cook a meal that he would like, practice his religious belief. These dormitories were therefore designed for communal living. To enable workers to live close to where they work and reduce the need to travel, the government allowed some factories to convert part of their space for dormitory housing subject to standards being met. Today, there are about 200,000 workers housed in the 43 purpose-built dormitories and about 95,000 housed in 1,200 factory converted dormitories. Most of these workers are from the construction, marine and process sectors. We have to 20,000 workers housed in construction temporary quarters, CTQs. Another 85,000 work permit and s pass holders from the construction sector live in HDB flats, private residential properties and other premises. Landlords must meet requirements and can be investigated for breaches. The government also set aside land to build recreation centres for migrant workers where they can access supermarkets, remittance services and sports fields. Today, there are eight recreation centres located in areas where there are more dormitories. Over the years, we have taken steps to raise the housing standards of our migrant workers. A key milestone was the enactment of the foreign Employee Dormitory Act, FIDA, in 2015. FIDA imposes higher standards on dormitories that accommodate 1,000 or more workers. For example, licensed operators were required to provide common recreational facilities like TV rooms, gyms, as well as provide access to amenities like mini-marts and Wi-Fi in the common areas. They are also required to have health facilities like sick bays or isolation rooms and draw up contingency plans for quarantine arrangements. MOM officers regularly inspect licensed dormitories to ensure compliance. In fact, the government reviewed these plans with the dormitory operators at the end of last year and conducted a tabletop exercise. What do you do? if you have an outbreak. But no one was quite thinking of something of the scale of COVID-19. In early February, MOM asked all FIDA licensed dormitories to each put aside at least 10 quarantine rooms. Those were the rooms that some of which Minister Lawrence and I went to inspect. Today, in dormitories with few infected workers, this provision has helped us to quickly isolate the close contacts. Those who are infected, of course, are removed as soon as we can. But their close contacts, you can isolate them and keep them for a while. Ms. Antia Ong asked about smaller accommodation types. Though not covered by FIDA, they must still comply with a whole range of regulations. These include BCA's standards for building structural safety 
SCDF's fire safety code, and NEA's rules on sanitary facilities. To questions by Mr. Peng Ing Huat and Associate Professor Walter Tessera, regulatory agencies all conduct inspections. MOM alone has about 100 dormitory inspectors, full-time, who work under the supervision of the Commissioner for Foreign Employee Dormitories, two deputy commissioners and eight assistant commissioners. Last year, these officers conducted 1,200 inspections and 3,000 investigations across all housing types. There will be many more when other agencies are included. Every year, MOM alone takes an average of 1,200 employers to task for unacceptable accommodation under the Employment of Foreign Manpower Act and about 20 operators for breach of FIDA license conditions. Where lapses are found, dormitory operators must rectify them immediately. For offences under FIDA, dormitory operators can be fined up to $50,000 and or jailed up to 12 months. Under the Employment of Foreign Manpower Act, Employers can also be fined up to $10,000 and or jailed up to 12 months. Other than enforcement, MOM proactively engages workers, employers and dorm operators. We conduct roadshows at the dormitories to hear from the workers themselves on improvements they would like to see. We survey the workers. About 9 in 10 say they are satisfied working in Singapore, I would recommend their friends or family to come here. Still, we educate the workers on what is acceptable accommodation and encourage them to alert MOM if they see something not right. We also involve the community. For example, MOM started a Colour My Dorm program about two years ago, a wall mural at Gantic Dormitory was painted by youth as a gift to the residents. Housing standards for our migrant workers have progressed over the years. Mr. Speaker, may I have your permission to show some photographs of what the newer uh, dormitories look like. This is one of those that have been built since the FIDA was passed into law. This is a slightly older one, but as you can see, it resembles some of our earlier HDB housing estates. They, and when I visited West Lake Toguan, it really felt very much like that. This one has got ensuite facilities, meaning that company takes a room, room comes with uh, sleeping areas, but also their own kitchen, their own uh, toilet facilities. And the next one is what some of them look like inside. It depends on the size of the room, how many can be allowed to be accommodated. And the next one. This is S11, where we have the highest number of infected workers so far. This is what a typical room looks like. I would say the size of the room, if you consider a badminton court, half it, and then add maybe about 20% of circulation space, that is what you get. And the next one. One of the dormitories has got a supermarket, which the migrant workers can use to buy the food that they wish to cook. and. And here, and the next one shows, this is before safe distancing, what a, a gym might look like in the bigger dormitories. So this is the newer ones. We will see how standards can be further raised. But keep in mind that there are also older dormitories, which perhaps have not quite reached these standards yet. What changes 
will be effective in reducing the transmission risk. Will these changes require different space provisions and technical standards or stronger regulatory levers that Mr. Lewis Ng has asked about? Inevitably, in any sort of environment where people gather in groups, there could be significant transmission. For example, the two places where there is substantial transmission are homes and workplaces. Likewise, when you have a large number of people living together in a communal setting, there is a very high likelihood of transmission. There was a significant spread, for example, on the US aircraft carrier, the Theodore Roosevelt, with 950 sailors getting infected within a few weeks. They were 20% of the crew. The virus respects no housing type, no nationality, no occupation. We will therefore need to relook how everyone interacts with one another at home and at our workplaces. Even the way we socialize will have to change. We will need a focus on public education. So the same for our migrant workers. But as Minister Lawrence Wong said earlier, we are still in the heat of the battle. We must be focused on bringing the outbreak under control and work out how we can exit from the circuit breaker and resume normal activities safely. When this is over, we will reflect and thoroughly look into areas where we could have done better so that we will be better prepared the next time.